I'm doctor because I went to the university for a long, long time and got something called a PhD in a topic called folklore. So I don't give you a shot, I give you a story, which is much more fun. So I'm a folklorist. I'm also a children's librarian, that was my career, and I'm also a storyteller, and I travel the world telling stories. And I'm also an author. I've written over 66 books, and these are just a few of them that I brought along to show today. <clears throat> I know you're going to be telling stories later, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, folklore and storytelling. And I think I'll start by telling a story from <clears throat> a uh, storyteller from the Seattle, uh, Seattle area. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and Vi Hilbert was a storyteller in the Seattle area. She belonged to the Upper Skagit tribe that lives north of Seattle. And um, she was known for her storytelling. Vi was a beautician. She fixed people's hair. And one day, um, a man from the University of Washington came to her and said, you know, we were told that you might be able to speak the Lachutzee language. And the Lachutzee language is a language that Native American people in the area spoke you know, a long time ago. She said, yes, when I grew up, that was what I spoke at home, was the Schutzseed. And the university man said, you know, no one can speak that language anymore. And we found up at the university a whole box full of audio tapes that are in that language. And no one knows what they said. Could you come take a listen? Because some anthropologist collected them a long time ago, and he's dead now. And she went up and listened, and she said, that's my Aunt Susie Sampson. That, that's my Uncle Ned on that tape. And these were all her relatives. And only she could understand what they were saying, because no one else could speak the language anymore. So she quit her job at the beauty parlor, and she spent the rest of her life. She had to make up a, a dictionary, had to make up an alphabet to write down her language. It has sounds like and you couldn't write in English, and she had to make up an uh, alphabet to write it down, and then she made a dictionary, and then she trans trans transcribed the tapes, wrote them down in her language, and then she translated them into English, and the University of Washington published books with her stories and with the translations of all the tapes. It's wonderful. So one of the stories that she told is called Little Basket Weaver, and I thought I'd tell it to you. This girl had trouble thinking. It was really hard for her to figure things out. She couldn't understand things, and the other children wouldn't play with her because she couldn't understand their games even. One day she was sitting all by herself under a tall cedar tree, and the tree bent over and spoke to her. The tree said, Girl, why are you sitting here all by yourself? Why aren't you out playing with the other children? They don't like to play with me. I can't understand their games. Oh, said the tree, that is really too bad. I have an idea. Would you like to learn how to make a cedar basket? I could teach you how. Oh, no, I couldn't do anything like that. I can never understand instructions. Oh, I could tell you every step to do, said the tree. No, said the girl, I know I couldn't do it. I don't understand things very well. The tree said, girl, could you try? Oh, I guess I could try. Good, said the tree, that is all we need. And the tree told her how to go and dig some roots and take some bark from the tree and prepare it and how to weave. And she wove and she wove and she wove and she wove a little cedar basket. The tree said, see, you did it. Go, go bring me some water in it. And she went to the river and she dipped and she brought it back and held it up. But the water had all run out. The tree said, girl, you didn't weave that tight enough. Can you do it again? Again. Again, I guess so. So she went and dug some more of the roots and prepared those the way he told her and took some more of the bark and prepared that the way he told her. And she wove and she wove and she wove and she wove another cedar basket. Okay, that looks better. Go and bring me some water. She went to the stream and she dipped and it was heavier and she brought it back and held it up. It was half full of water. Girl, that's better, but it's not right yet. Can you do it again? Again? Mm-hmm. Again. I guess so. Uh, it was hard for her to understand things, but she could keep on trying. And so she went and dug some more roots and prepared them and took some more bark and prepared it. And she wove and she wove and she wove and she wove another cedar basket. And the tree saw that she was weaving it very tightly this time and that she had learned. 
He said, I have an idea. Why don't you weave a design around the top of the basket? You could copy my branches. Oh, I like that idea. And she wove a little design around the top of the basket. And she finished a cedar bark basket. Oh, it's beautiful, said the tree. It's beautiful. Well, bring me water. She took it to the stream and she dipped and it was really heavy and she carried it back and held it up. It was full to the brim with water. Girl, you have done it. You've woven a perfect cedar basket. Now what should you do? Now what should you do? Now that you know how to weave a cedar basket. Oh, I should weave more baskets and get them all to, the el get them to all the elders in my tribe, to all the older people. Oh, that's a good thing, said the tree. Do that, girl. But think carefully. Is there anything else you should do now that you know how to weave a cedar basket? I think I should teach. I should teach all the girls and all the women how to weave cedar baskets. Yes, said the tree. That's what you should do. And that is exactly what she did. And to this, to this day, because of that one girl, to this day, all the girls and all the women in the Klickitat people know how to weave beautiful cedar baskets. And if you go to the Seattle area in the museums, you'll see these beautiful baskets woven out of cedar bark and cedar roots that, that the women make there. Okay, and if you can remember that story, go and tell it to somebody. Vi says her story should be shared all around the world. I have another story, and this story is from England, and it's called The Great Smelly Slobbery Small Tooth Dog. A girl and her father lived in the house by the countryside. One night, the father was coming home late at night from a business trip, and he was attacked by robbers. He was about to be killed when out of the forest left a great, smelly, slobbery, small-toothed dog. Woof! Chased the robbers away. The man said, Dog, you just saved my life. Come to my house tomorrow. I'll give you a reward. Will you come? Woof! I will. Oh, the man said, let me tell you about the treasures that I have in my house, and you can choose the treasure you want for your reward. In my house, I have a golden fish in a golden bowl, and the fish can speak 100 languages. Would you like that for your reward? No, I would not. Oh. I also have a golden bird in a golden cage, and the bird can sing 1,000 songs. Would you like that for your reward? No, I would not. Oh, I also have a golden goose. It lays one egg a day, solid gold. I bet you'd like that for your reward. No, I would not. Dog, I've just named my best treasures. What can I give you to thank you for saving my life? In your house, you have a, a treasure you haven't even mentioned. In your house, you have a beautiful daughter. Uh-huh, that's a treasure I want, that's a treasure I want, that's a treasure I want. <laughs> the man hadn't even thought, of course, his daughter was his best treasure. Come to my house tomorrow, come to my house tomorrow, he said. And he went home and told his daughter what had happened. I can't let you go with that great smelly slobbery small-toothed dog. It's too disgusting. She said, Father, that dog saved your life and you gave your word. I will go with the great smelly slobbery small-toothed dog. I won't be afraid and I'll try hard not to be disgusted. In the morning, the dog came to carry her away. Woof, is she ready? Woof, is she ready? Woof, she came out in her traveling costume. Woof, she's so beautiful. Woof, she's so beautiful. Climb on, back, on my back, hold tight to my fur. I'll take you to my house. And off they went. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields to a great green hedge of bushes across the field. But the dog just leaped over the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields. A second hedge, he leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields. A third hedge, he leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields. Up to a castle. That's my house. Servants come out, bring the girl in. They had a room prepared just for her already. There were dresses and silks and satins and velvets in just her size. Shelves of books, the kind she most liked to read. And every night the dog would come to her room and they'd be fed delicious food and he'd tell her funny stories. They had a good time together. In the afternoon they'd play in the lawn. He had a golden ball. The girl would throw the ball and the dog would... <laughs> 
bring it back. She would throw the golden ball. He would ha, 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 bring it back. They'd sit in the shade of the tree, and she would stroke his smelly fur. But she would say, oh, dog, you are sweet as a honeycomb, sweet as a honeycomb. But at night, when she was alone in her room, she'd cry and say, I'm held prisoner here by a great smelly, slobbery, small-toothed dog. Yuck. One day, the dog noticed that she had been crying. Girl, why have you been crying? I gave you everything to make you happy here. You give me everything, but I miss my father. Oh, well, climb on my back. I'll take you home for a visit. And off they went. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields to the first green hedge. Before we jumped over, we said, wait, girl, before I jump over the hedge, what do you call me? Hmm? What do you call me? Oh, I call you sweet as a honeycomb. Yes, he leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields to the second green hedge. Go, what do you call me? She was thinking about getting home to see her father. She was not thinking about being kind to the dog. Great smelly, slobbery, small to dog. That's what I call him. <laughs> he went back and didn't take her home. Sometime later, she's crying again. Girl, why are you crying? I gave you everything to make you happy here. Give me everything. I miss my father. I'll climb on my back. I'll take you home for a visit. And off they went. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields, the first green hedge. Go, what do you call me? I call you sweet as a honeycomb. Yes. He leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields, the second green hedge. Go, what do you call me? I call you sweet as a honeycomb. Yes. He leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields, the third green hedge. Go, what do you always call me? She could see her house in the distance. She was thinking about getting home and seeing her father. She wasn't thinking about being kind to the dog anymore. Great smelly, slobbery, small tooth. Sometime later, she was crying again. Girl, why are you always, is it your father again? Climb on my back. I'll take you home for a visit. And off they went. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields, the first green hedge. Go, what do you call me? She vowed to say only kind things this time. So she said, sweet as a honeycomb. Yes. He leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields, the second green hedge. Go, what do you call me? Sweet as a honey. Yes. He leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields, the third green hedge. Go, why do you call me? She remembered. She said it. Sweet as a honeycomb. Yes. He leaped the hedge in a single bound. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields, up to her house. She had her hand on the door to go in. Girl, one more time. One more time. What do you call me? What do you call me? One she had her hand on the door to go in. She was not thinking about being kind to that dog. Great smelly. She looked down and saw the look of pain in that dog's eyes. Oh, dog, I'm sorry. Oh, dog, I'm so sorry. I call you sweet as a honeycomb, sweeter than a honeycomb. When the dog heard those kind words and saw the look of love in that girl's eyes, he leaped to his feet, ripped off his fur, and became a handsome prince with the smallest teeth you ever did see. So the girl and the prince were married and lived in his castle in the countryside. And every day they'd play in the lawn, and she would throw the golden ball, and he would, ha, 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 here you are, dear. <laughs> And she would throw the golden ball. <laughs> Here you are, dear. And they would sit in the shade of the tree, and she would stroke his hair. It was not smelly at all anymore. And she'd say, oh, prince, you are sweet as a honeycomb, sweeter than a honeycomb. Now, I found the story in a collection by Kate Briggs of British Folk Tales. It was called The Great Foul Small Tooth Dog. I don't use the word foul, so I called it The Great Smelly Small Tooth Dog. And I was telling stories at the International School in Rotterdam in Holland. I was staying with the librarian, and one day I was having tea with the librarian's wife. And they had a big dog named Ben, about this big. Ben was sleeping by the stove, and suddenly I heard Ben stand up and shake his head. He was behind me. And Linda, the librarian's wife, screamed, don't move and don't look, because when Ben shook his head, he had 
a slobber stream like this long hanging from his jowl. He shook his head and it broke loose and went flying. It landed on my sweater. She said, don't move and don't look and grab the paper towel and mop me up. I said, oh, I just had a brainstorm. I think my new book should be called The Great Smelly Slobbery Small Tooth Dog. Can you all say that? Smelly, slobbery, small tooth. Try it. Smelly, slobbery, try it. Smelly, slobbery, small tooth. Smelly, slobbery, small tooth. Smelly, slobbery, small tooth. It makes, you, it makes you slobber to even say it, doesn't it? Does anyone know what, it is, what it's called when you have a poetic device where it sounds the same at the beginning of the word? Tongue twister, there's a, there's, a, there's a really lovely poetic word for it. Have you learned it yet? Alliteration. Can you all say alliteration? Alliteration. And I love to put those in my stories because then when any parent that reads it or anyone reads it out loud, they have to go, smelly, slubbery, small tooth, and it sounds really cool. You know all those S's? Smelly, slubbery, small tooth. Sounds cool. So I emailed the, the illustrator. I said, Julie, Julie, can you put slobber in the pictures? Not, and she said, I can sure put slobber. Not too late. And she added slobber to all the pictures. Julie Paschus, who lives in Seattle, made the illustrations. That's her dog, Lily, who she used for the model for the dog in the story. That's Julie and I at her house in Seattle. I usually don't get to, to meet my illustrators, but Julie lives right there. So I got to go to her house when she's around the book. And Julie knew that in England, flyers have meaning. So on the end papers of the book, she drew flyers and what they mean. And it's really amazing. You could look on every page in the book, and you'll see the flyer that has an emotional meaning of that page. So on the first page, he's attacked by robbers. The dog rescues him, and she drew thistles. And a thistle stands for danger and protection. Then the father went home, and he was feeling very miserable. And she drew marigolds, and marigolds stand for despair. And the girl said, I'll be brave, I'll go. And she drew oak leaves. What do oak leaves stand for? Bravery. Bravery. So it's really fun to look at the book up close. Julie wanted it to look kind of like a medieval tapestry. So there's, and she's trying to think of how to show all this jumping over bushes. So there's one bush, two bushes, third bush. And then she wanted, um, she tried to do it this way. <coughs> Over the fields and over the fields. And then look, it just continues. It's a tapestry continues. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields. First bush, second bush. What do you call me, girl? Great smelly. Whoa. Takes her back. Then she did a ribbon front and back. This is kind of interesting how she showed it. Over the fields, over the fields, over the fields. She's trying to think of interesting ways to show all that repetition. What do you call me, girl? Great smelly slobbery. Whoa. Take her back home again. And then he saw her crying again, and then he took her all the way, all the way to the front door. And then she saw the look of pain in the dog's eyes. And Julie drew lilacs for the first emotion of love. What flower is going to be on the next page? A rose. A rose. Ta-da! Now, I don't like the way she drew the prince. I think he was really a dog and pulled his fur off. And she's got like a silly dog costume on his back. That's really dorky. I don't like that. But, you know, she's the illustrator, so she can do what she wants, and I'm the author, so I can write what I want. We just have to kind of agree a little bit. And there's the last page. Now, does that story... Remind you of any other story that you have ever heard? No. No? Yes. Yes. <coughs> what? Well, it's, come on, think. That's a, just, that's a, then you go to another story that you all know. <laughs> it's the exact same plot to another story that you've all seen a movie, a Walt Disney movie of, and that you all know. Beauty and the Beast. In France, it's the father promises his daughter to a beast. She's taken to a castle, learns to love the beast. He becomes a handsome prince. Across the English Channel in England, it's a smelly dog. It's the exact same story. Folk tales travel around the world, and they change a little bit each time they move. They can be this way, that way. And folk tales, oh, how, 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 how do you define a folk tale? What's a folk tale? Who knows what a folk tale is? What's a folk tale? 
Folk tales can tell lessons, but not all folk tales tell lessons at all. Mm -hmm. What else? Is it? How do you define a folk tale? Yeah. He has the one and only definition of folk tale. It's passed from generation to generation to generation. It might be a fantasy. It could even be true. It, it might have a moral. It might not. But it is a story, a narrative, that's passed from person to person. The oldest stories we know are 4,000 years old. They were written down on cuneiform clay tablets in Sumeria and Babylonia, and those clay tablets still exist. And those stories are still being told today. So it's old, 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 old stuff. Well, there's a whole book of them called The Oldest Stories in the World. Uh, there's this one that I, that, the one that, I, that, that continued until today is the one in, in which appears in a lot of folk tales, this motif, where a man uh, shoots an arrow at a bird three times, and he scares the bird three times, and the bird gets mad. And the bird gives a man a ride in the sky on his wings, and the man goes up, and he drops the man. And then he catches him, he says, that's the way I felt the first time you shot an arrow at me. And then he goes up, and he drops him, and he says, that's the way I felt the second time. And again, and that's the way I felt the third time. Did you learn your lesson? And, and when he goes up, each time he asks the man, what do you see? And the man says, wow, you know, that, that lake looks like a, like a pond now. You know, and he says, "Oh, okay." He drops him. He goes higher. He says, What's the, what, do you, what do you see now? Oh, the lake looks like a, you know, just a bowl of water. And then the next time, what's like? The lake looks like a teacup. You know, he's, you know, he's getting higher and higher and higher, which makes you wonder how they knew that in the days before airplanes. What would it look like from above? But anyway, yeah. So, yeah. Now, um, I thought you might enjoy seeing my next book. This is a picture book, and, and you'll recognize this motif also. You call it a, when stories are, are similar, they have the same motif. So the the, the story of Cinder, of uh, uh, what's it called, um, Slobber, Slobber Dog, and Beauty and the Beast. It's the same motif, the same type story. See if you recognize this one. I'm sure you will. Now I've written it, and I've rewritten and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. I probably write 50 times over and over again. The illustrator has made the pictures in black and white, and she just has to make a few changes in these, and now she can begin to paint. We've approved them, and the illustrator, the editor approved, and I approved, and my daughter and her husband, who teach in Bangkok, are co-authoring it, and they approved. There was a girl called Little Flea. She earned her scratchy name because her best friends in the world were dogs, cats, squirrels, and chipmunks. Her mother was gone, but her fairy godmother lived in the garden fountain, ready to give advice when Little Flea needed it. And we like the picture because she's got lots of animals around her, which we think is kind of cute. One day, she really needed advice. Her father told her, Little Flea, it's time to get married. Me, Little Flea, married? No! She ran to the garden fountain. Godmother, godmother, please appear. Little Flea is in trouble. I need you here. Voila, that's the French part. Can you say voila? Voila. Voila, for that. Voila. There was the fairy godmother. Oh, little flea, of course you don't have to get married unless you want to. Tell your father you will not marry until he finds you a dress that is the color of the sun, the color of the moon, and the color of the stars. That should slow him down. It's just a trick, right? Bad luck for little flea. Her father was friends with a wizard. And voila, there was the dress with the shoes to match. Fairy godmother, what should I do? Oh, dear, okay. Uh, let's try this, said fairy godmother. Tell your father he must find you a magic carriage that moves when you shout, off we go. But more bad luck for little flea. The wizard could do that too. Voila, voila, there was the carriage. Oh, fairy godmother, what should I do? Time to try something else, said her fairy godmother. Hop into the, your carriage and call, off we go. Just see where the carriage takes you. So little flea climbed into the magic carriage and called. You ready? Off we go. <laughs> off she rolled over fields and through forests till the carriage stopped at a palace. 
There was her fairy godmother waiting. It's all arranged. I got you a job at the palace. Me, little flea, a job. No! A little work never hurt anyone. All you have to do is sweep and mop and take care of the dogs and cats. You'll like that part at least. Just do as I say, and who knows what might happen. Her godmother always gave good advice. A little flea grumpily grabbed the mop and set to work. in the wrong direction here. So I had to cut everything out and paste it together to make a dummy of it. Life in the palace was hard. The dogs and cats were fine, but there was a sassy prince who teased her all the time. Oh, little flea, don't give fleas to my dogs and cats. She would just sweep dirt in his face and stomp off. What a feisty little flea you are, sassed the prince. One day, the prince bragged, I'm going to a dance at my cousin's palace tonight. Too bad little fleas can't come. Godmother, godmother, please appear. Little flea is in trouble. I need you here. Voila, there was a fairy godmother. How are things going to the palace, little flea? Having a good time? Definitely not, but I do want to go to the dance. So her godmother brought out the beautiful dress and the magic carriage. Little flea hopped in and shouted, Off we go! Be sure to come back before midnight, called her fairy godmother. You got the story motif now? When little flea arrived at the ball, the prince looked up and voila, in walked the most beautiful girl he had ever seen. She was sparkling, she was radiant, she was the belle of the ball. Everyone wanted to dance with her, the prince most of all. What's your name? I won't say. Will you dance? Well, okay. The prince pulled little flea onto the dance floor. They began to whirl and twirl and her head spun. The little flea kept her wits about her. At a quarter to twelve, she ran for her carriage. Wait, shouted the prince. Let me see you home. Little flea just called, off we go. And away she rolled. Next morning, the prince was in a daze. I saw the most beautiful girl at the dance last night. I think I'm in love. Is that so, sneered little flea, shaking dust in his face. How nice for you. What's her name? He didn't even know her name. Next evening, another ball. What's your name? I won't say. Will you dance? Well, okay. This time they whirled and twirled and walked and talked and could have talked all night until... Until you know what, right? Almost midnight, little flea turned to leave, but the prince held tight to her hand. Please let me see you home. He had one foot in the carriage when little flea called... Off we go! Away sped the carriage and the poor prince was left on his backside in the mud. My, my, said Little Flea next day. How'd your coat get so muddy? I thought you were going to the ball. Never mind, huffed the prince. Another night, another ball. They whirled and twirled and walked and talked, and Little Flea forgot to watch the clock. It's midnight. I have to leave. Bong! Her fairy godmother hadn't said why she should leave. Now Little Flea found out. Just as she ran for her carriage, her dress began turning to rags. And here came the prince. Wait for me. Thinking quickly, she tossed back her shoe. Prince, I lost my shoe. Can you get it? Of course. And he turned for the shoe. Little Flea laughed. Off we go. Now the prince had the shoe. All he had to do was find the foot to fit it. So word was set out all over the kingdom, and hundreds of hopeful girls came, but that shoe just would not fit. Little Flea sat in her corner, chuckling to herself. When all the girls had gone, Little Flea walked up. Well, thank you, prince. You found my shoe. The prince looked down. It fit. He looked up at that face, and voila. It can't be, little flea. Yes, silly prince, that was me. Then what happens now, gasped the prince. Who knows, smiled little flea. We'll just have to wait and see. Did they marry? We can't say. But we're certain that either way, with the fairy godmother giving advice, all was happy ever after. And of course, that's a version of what story? Cinderella. Cinderella. 
There were thousands of Cinderella versions all over the world in many cultures. And this is from France. The original Cinderella that you know is from France. There are many versions, but the one that you know best with the stepmother and the ball is from France. And this is also from France. So like a different grandma in a different part of France retold it in a completely different... It's actually the grandfather, I think, told this one in a completely different way. Which do you like best? The real cin the one Cinderella you know with the... the, the where they get married, or this one where she's sassy and doesn't really maybe get married, or who knows? Yeah. So what what should the title be? We we can't find we can't figure out a title for it. What should? Sassy princess. Would feisty Cinderella work for you? Yeah. Feisty flea. Feisty flea. Someone someone at the school yesterday said flea. Flinderella. <laughs> Getting the, it's really the hardest thing to get is, is the title, to get, to get the title right. Well, I know you're going to be telling stories, so I'm going to teach you a story right now that you can tell. <coughs> and hopefully you can go home and tell it to somebody tonight and practice it, okay? It's, a, it's a, a folktale from Thailand. It's a riddle story, so there's not a lot to learn. There once was a rich man, listen carefully, because I'm, I'm going I'm to ha have you guys telling it, so pay close attention. Are you with me? Okay. There was once a rich man who wanted his son to get married. He did not want a daughter-in-law who was necessarily rich or beautiful. He did want a daughter-in-law who was wise and kind and good. So he gave his son a riddle to ask every girl he met to find the right girl. And here is the question. If you had a big fish, what would you do to make that fish feed your family as long as possible? If you had a big fish, what would you do to make that fish feed your family as long as possible? That would be good, but I'm sorry it's already dead. <laughs> Good idea otherwise. Yes. Share it? How, how's that going to help? This is very unusual because no one ever guesses the answer right away. And she got the answer right away. Yeah, we'll, we'll try some other answer. We'll try some other answers, but hold that thought. Yeah, what, what, what were you going to suggest? Preserve the fish. Preserve it, and then you could, you know, have a little bit, you know, have a little bit. Kill it and eat it, but be gone then. You want it to last as long. You, you want to feed your family as long. I think the, I think the word is to feed your family as long as possible. I, I probably said it wrong. To make it feed your family as long as possible. Any other, any other suggestions? Well, maybe one week, maybe a year. As long as you can make it feed your family. Yes. I start for three days to eat some. That's a good idea. Yeah. Eat a little bit every day. Eat a little bit every day. Yeah. That, that's not. That's not the answer. You can't marry the prince. Sorry. You want. You want to try and marry the prince? You want to try and marry the prince? Do what? Use it as fertilizer. Use it as fertilizer. That would be a good idea. But that you can't marry the prince. That's the wrong answer. I'm sure you're relieved to hear that. Any, any other guesses? Any guesses? After a long while, he saw a girl coming down the road, and she was not strikingly beautiful, and she definitely wasn't rich. She looked very poor. But she looked kind and good and maybe wise. So he asked her, if you had a big fish, what would you do to make it provide food for your family uh, for the longest possible time? And she said, oh, I, I'd cook it with a lot of vegetables. <laughs> And then I would give some of the food to all of my relatives, some to all of my neighbors, some to all of my friends. And then in the future, if any of them had a big fish, they would come share with us. And in that way, I'd feed my family for the longest possible time. Oh. So they were married, yes. Now, okay, let, let's go back to the beginning and see if you got it. You start the story by saying there was a rich man who wanted his son to get married. He didn't care if the, he didn't he didn't want the the daughter-in-law to be 
wealthy or beautiful. He wanted to be wise and kind and good. You got that? He says, I'm going to give you a riddle to ask every girl you meet. And the riddle was, if you have a big fish, what would you do to make it feed your family the longest possible time? Okay? And then the answer is, and then you ask everybody the question, and then the answer is, a girl came down. She wasn't looking totally beautiful. She wasn't very rich, but she was very wise. And she said, I would, and good, I would cook it with a lot of vegetables, give some to all my relatives, some to all my friends and all my neighbors. And in the future, if any of them had a big fish, they would come and share, and I would feed my family the longest possible time. Now, I want each of you to go and listen carefully. You're going to go. You're going to face a wall. You're going to pretend. You're going to pretend there is an audience behind the wall listening. You're going to look at their eyes and make eye contact with the audience. You're going to project your voice so you speak loudly and they can all hear you. And you're going to tell the story, okay? So quick, quick, find a wall. Okay, move, move away from your friends so you got space. Put your arms out so you got space. You can... You can have the floor. Oops, whoops. Can I talk to the floor? No, because you're, someone will be in your, in your, your, your line of vision. Find a wall. Find a wall. Find a wall. There's, there's walls here. That's good. You're, you're good. You got a wall. Okay. Okay. Stand, you need to be standing. Standing so you can use your whole body. So you can use your whole body and make gestures if you want to. Okay. When I say go, you're going to start telling. Once there was a rich man. Get ready. Get set. Go. When you finish, come back and sit down. <laughs> okay. Who wants to demonstrate telling that story for us? I need, I need, I need someone to come and demonstrate. Telling the story for us. Okay, you, you can you can come because you had the good you you had the right answer, so you can do it. You can go first. It should be Maria. Yeah. Okay, Maria, come on. Come on. That's good. It's fine. Yeah. Um, 
answer me from the story. Here's the end. He met a girl, not too beautiful, certainly not too rich, but wearing So that's your story, and you all know the story now. So what, tonight, go home and 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 you can practice telling the story to your family, and let them try to guess. You know, let them have lots of guesses before you tell them the answer, because people don't usually get the answer. So take your time, and and when you tell the story, you're gonna look at them and make eye contact, and you're gonna speak distinctly and loudly so they can understand you, and that's your first storytelling experience. And later on, you're going to be learning, I think, many stories to tell or something and having a lot more work on it. Okay. Uh, do, do you have any questions you'd like to ask me about being a folklorist or a storyteller or a children's librarian or an author? Yes. How do you face stage fright? You don't think about yourself. You think about the audience. It's not about you. It's about the audience. So you think about them and helping them understand and get the story that you know that they've never heard. You want them to have the story. So you give them the story, and you just think about them and not about you. Good, good question. Yes. Oh, it was really a lot of fun. I went to Indiana University, and you take a lot of classes, and I studied folk music of Latin America, and I studied Asian folk tales and African folk tales, and just lots and lots of fun, of fun classes. But then you have to do something called a, a dissertation, which is supposed to be studying one thing in depth. And what I ended up doing was doing an index of folk tales from all around the world that were published for children. So I read 550 collections that had been that were in libraries, and for every single story, I wrote down the title and all the subjects that were in there, and then the motifs because Stith Thompson, a folklorist, just assigned motifs to every folk tale. So like Cinderella has a motif of going to the ball three times, losing a slipper, wicked stepmothers. So I, in my index, I put all the motifs. And it took uh, 10 years to write, to do that. To do, I got the dissertation, then I made a book. It took 10 years to finish it. So, but it was really fun. I mean, I loved, if it's something you love studying, it's, it's fun. If you don't love it, don't do it. <laughs> Seriously, do something else, you know. To publish a book, it takes about two years from the time that the publisher accepts it. First, you've got to write it, and it's got to be really good. And to write it, you know, I just rewrite and rewrite, read to many, many, many groups of kids. Like right now, I read to you. I might make a couple little simple changes from what I, what you reacted when I read it. I just keep reading and reading. Um, do you like the word voila in there? Does that sound okay to you? Yeah. It's okay? Yeah, okay. Because it's kind of strange. Yeah. In the original, in the original story, uh, when she got in the carriage, she said, en route. But, I mean, that doesn't work at all. So I, had, I put en route. It means, it means on the road, on the road, right? Yeah, it, it literally, if you wanted, it's a French hotel. So, I mean, if you wanted to do it literally, if you would, she would say, hit the road. But that isn't going to work. Too. It's too colloquial. <laughs> so I did, off we go. Yeah. So then it's about two years because um, the, editor, the editor has me rewrite, rewrite. And then also the illustrator makes the pictures and they have to redraw and redraw. So it takes about two years to get it, to get it totally finished. And the editor really makes a lot of corrections. So the first, the first time an editor looked at my manuscript, I was really angry. She came back and had marked all over it. And I said, who she thinks she is? I'm the author. Look what she did. But now I know the editor is making me the best author possible. So now when I get that, I'm excited to see what changes they suggest because they're helping me be really good. It's sort of like your teachers. They get your, your, your stories, and hopefully you write it all, mark it all up, right? Do you mark it all up? You don't mark it all up? Oh, 
You're supposed to mark it all up. That's the way they get good. You, they should mark it all. And when you get it back, the more red marks, the better. Say, look at all the red marks on this teacher. You're making me a really good author. Yay, I'm going to write it again right away. <laughs> yes. I've, I've had published 66. This will be 67. But I have more written at home that I have to find someone to publish. I think our time is up, isn't it? Thank you so much. Have fun with your folktale unit when you learn to tell stories.